Greetings, AP Chemistry. This is uh, Mr. Harper with your long-awaited weekend podcast, which we're putting up here on YouTube. Um, In this podcast, we're going to talk about electrolysis, okay? Now, what electrolysis is, in contrast to what we've talked about earlier this week, it is a a non-spontaneous redox reaction, okay? Earlier this week, we've talked about uh, galvanic cells and how the redox reactions that happen in a galvanic cell are spontaneous. They happen by themselves. They have a positive potential, and they have a value of delta G, which is negative. Well, electrolytic cells and electrolysis reactions are the reverse. These are ones that are non-spontaneous. They will have um, a potential, which is negative, and a free energy change, which is positive. And what that means is that in order for an electrolysis reaction to happen, we have to force it to happen. Okay? So, um, we can force that to happen uh, against the natural direction, because basically you can think about like an electrolysis reaction is sort of like the reverse of the reaction in a galvanic cell. It's going the opposite way of the way it would naturally go. We can force a reaction to happen against the natural direction by applying a potential, okay? by applying a voltage using a battery. So I can force an electrolytic uh, reaction to happen using a battery. Okay, And here's the applications. What we use electrolysis for in chemistry is to purify metals. Okay, number one, this is a very big industrial use. You probably have never wondered how do we get pure copper, how do we get pure aluminum for your soda cans, how do we get um, steel, all these different things. These are, all, you know, not necessarily steel, but um, a lot of different metals are purified using electrolysis. Um, also, uh, chrome plating or gold plating, if you uh, ladies or guys out there wear uh, gold plated jewelry, that was plated using, ele- using an electrolysis reaction. Um, making chlorine and production of bleach involves electrolysis and also recharging a battery. If any of you guys drive your car, you know you have a part called an alternator, okay, that is in your, under the hood, okay, and that recharges your car as you drive. Well, that, that process of recharging the battery is actually an electrolysis reaction. Okay, so let's draw a picture. What does an electrolytic cell look like. Okay, this is a, a a cell where we have an electrolysis reaction happening. Okay. Well you may remember that when we talked about galvanic cells before we had um you know we had to have the two half reactions separated in two different chambers of a vessel or two separate beakers or something. An electrolytic cell here is a little bit different. Okay, so I'm gonna draw a picture. Here is my vessel which is going to contain the substance I'm going to electrolyze. Okay, and for the sake of argument, guys, we're going to say that here we are electrolyzing molten sodium chloride. Okay? When you melt sodium chloride, by the way, guys, we're going to electrolyze, my, in our example, molten sodium chloride. When this melts, you will have a liquid that is composed of sodium ions and chloride ions. You have to get it pretty hot in order to get it to melt, but it will indeed melt. Okay, so here is our vessel. And we're going to have our molten sodium chloride here in in this vessel. So we've got a bunch of sodium ions and chloride ions floating around there in the solution. I'm also going to have two electrodes dipped into my solution, just like we had before. Okay, But uh, in this case, the identity of these electrodes is usually going to be something which is going to be inert. Okay, oftentimes you're going to have an inert electrode. Now, if you guys remember, I gave you guys a list of inert electrodes, and oftentimes it's going to be platinum, palladium, or graphite are going to be your um, your uh, inert electrodes there. Okay? These electrodes, okay, so we're going to say for, for the sake of argument, these, this is made out of platinum, because I like platinum. Okay? And uh, somewhere here in the cell, we're going to have a little box. And this box here represents a battery. Okay, I'm just not very good at drawing a battery, but we're going to call that there. This is a battery. Okay, and just like we saw in a galvanic cell then, these two electrodes are going to be connected by a wire. Okay, this side over here, the positive terminal. Okay, I'm running out of space to draw. I'm going to call this here. This side is the positive end. Okay, this electrode right there is the positive one. This is going to be our anode. Here, the negative polarity terminal, this one right here, in an electrolytic cell, is going to be our cathode. Now, you will notice, guys, that if you compare an electrolytic cell to a galvanic cell, the polarities of the anode and the cathode are reversed. Okay? Now, of course, we remember, guys, what type of reaction always happens at the anode? As you guys have learned, the anode always is going to be an oxidation 
reaction. The cathode will always be the reduction half reaction. All the time, all the time, all the time. Okay, so here we go. Now if we have a bunch of sodium ions and chloride ions and sodium ions and chloride ions here floating around in solution, let's imagine here what is going to take place. We have these two species. Which of them can be oxidized? And of course the answer to that question is chlorine. The chlorine, the chloride ions here, is that's what's going to be oxidized, okay? So the half reaction that is taking place over here at our anode is going to be, excuse me, Cl minus goes to Cl2 plus two electrons. We're going to have to balance that baby out right there, okay? That's our oxidation half reaction. Our chloride ion is going to be oxidized over here. And then at the cathode, something's going to be reduced. The species that is reduced here in this liquid salt is going to be the sodium ions. So here's the reduction half reaction. We're going to have sodium plus, plus an electron, goes to sodium metal. And this, guys, just in case you ever wondered, is how you actually get sodium metal. Sodium metal is so reactive that uh, it doesn't, you can't mine it out of the ground because it reacts with the, with the waters in the air. It always forms compounds, okay? But if we want to obtain pure sodium metal, we, achieve, we get that through electrolysis of a molten salt or something else of that nature, okay? So there we go. These are the oxidation and the reduction half reactions. Now, guys, let's take a look here at what the potential for this cell is going to be. Okay, if I look at my oxidation, let me just switch pen colors here uh, really quick. Okay, let's just uh, take a look here what our cell potential is going to be. If we take, take our look at our oxidation half reaction, okay, this gives us Cl2 plus two electrons. Okay, the standard potential for this, if we're assuming here we're under standard conditions, this is going to be negative 1.36 volts. Okay. For our cathode reaction, the reduction of sodium, okay, sodium plus here is gaining an electron, is being reduced, and we're making sodium metal. The potential for this half reaction is negative 2.71 volts. And if we look at the total potential for the cell all together, the potential for the cell is going to be negative 4.07 volts. Okay, now what does that mean? Okay. That means for this reaction, okay, by the way, guys, the overall reaction, if we were to add this all together, we'd have to multiply this in here by two. The overall reaction would look like this. We're going to get two chloride ions plus two sodium ions yields Cl2 plus two sodium. That would be our overall reaction for this electrolytic cell, the overall action that's going on, okay? Here's what that means, guys. This potential here is negative. For a galvanic cell, the potential is positive, meaning that when that reaction happens, it produces that amount of voltage, okay? When the cell potential here is negative, this means that is the voltage that must be applied in order to get the reaction to happen. This reaction will not happen by itself. In order to electrolyze our sodium chloride, we will have to apply a potential of 4.07 volts at least, you know, we could, we could add more too, but, uh, you know, that's the minimum potential that would have to be applied to get this reaction to happen, okay? And uh, here's how it works. We have to force that to happen. That's what the battery here is for, okay? When you, the battery here is in the circuit, that's going to supply a voltage, and it's going to force the reaction to happen in the way that it doesn't want to, okay? If we look at the direction of electron travel, it's the same as for a galvanic cell. Electrons are always flowing from the anode, over here to the cathode. So we have electrons, electrons traveling this direction, whatever, okay, it's going from all the time from anode to cathode, going from the oxidation to the reduction, like that, okay? But that's forced to happen here by this battery. The battery basically acts like an electron pump and is forcing the reaction to happen, okay? Now, if we were gonna look at what we would observe, as this reaction happens, I'm going to demonstrate, guys, on, on Monday, an electrolytic cell for you guys. Let's think about what we would observe if the cell were running, okay? Here at the cathode, we have sodium ions that are getting reduced, right? So we have these electrons that are coming down here, coming down to my cathode down here, while the sodium ions that are in solution, these are taking that electron. So these are, you know, coming over here, they're getting an electron, they're being reduced. So you would expect to see that over here, what you guys are going to, what would happen is you would start building up sodium metal on the surface of my electrode. And that, or that might fall off and, you know, run to the bottom of my cell or what have you. But 
we're going to be producing solid sodium metal at this terminal of my electrolytic cell. In a similar fashion over here, guys, these chloride ions are coming over here, and they're giving up an electron, and they're forming Cl2. So what you would expect to have happen here, guys, is we're going to see some bubbles over here at this electrode, and what those bubbles are going to be is these are going to be chlorine gas, Cl2 gas, that is bubbling out of solution. If I were to collect this gas right here, that's one way I could I could capture I could produce um, chlorine elemental chlorine gas by electrolysis. So there we go, guys. That is a that is what an electrolytic cell looks like. That's a diagram of an electrolytic cell. Okay. Now, besides electrolytic cells being new, another kind of new idea here is the thing that we're electrolyzing is molten sodium chloride. Okay. So far, we've been looking at solutions. Here, this is a molten salt. Okay. Sometimes you'll electrolyze a molten salt, like in the case that you want to uh, achieve your, or, or obtain sodium metal or pure chlorine gas, but sometimes also we'll electrolyze solutions. Let's look at how that might be different. Okay, let me switch my pen here back to blue. Let's go on to the next slide, okay? Let's consider the electrolysis of an aqueous solution, okay? Okay, here's going to be my example. We're going to look here at an example and we're going to call this aqueous sodium chloride. Okay, we're going to compare and contrast what goes on. Again, let's draw here a picture of my vessel. I'm going to have some sort of vessel here where I've got a liquid here, but this is going to be aqueous sodium chloride. So I'm going to have sodium ions here. I'm going to have chloride ions floating around, but we're also going to have predominantly water. So I'm going to call this one molar aqueous sodium chloride. We're going to call this 298 Kelvin, and so we're going to be under standard conditions. Once again, guys, we're going to have my electrodes in here, and I'm going to call this an inert electrode. Okay, so I'm going to make these my platinum electrodes. This is going to be a platinum electrode here, and again, I'm using inert electrodes so they don't react during the electrolysis reaction. I'm going to connect these turkeys here by a wire, but in my circuit is going to be a battery, which will supply my voltage that I need to force this to occur. This will be my positive end, this will be my negative end, okay? So here's my positive electrode, here's my negative electrode, okay? And this is gonna be the anode, and this is going to be the cathode over here. Okay, so here's the diagram of my cell. Now let's figure out what reaction is going to happen at the anode and the cathode, okay guys? If we think about it, Let's think about reduction that is going to uh, take place over here, okay? Um, if, okay, well actually let's think about oxidation first. Okay, so here at the anode, we look at these species that we have here in this solution, which of these can be oxidized, okay? And there's one that stands out like a sore thumb. Obviously guys, we could oxidize here uh, the chlorine, or the chloride ion I would say. So here at the anode, okay, what's going to happen, these three species in the solution, this is the one that can be oxidized, we know that because it has an extra electron, that can be removed, so just like before, the oxidation half reaction that we see is going to be 2 Cl- minus goes to Cl2 plus 2 electrons, okay? Over here at the cathode, let's think about what's taking place. Well, here in solution, we have to decide what's going to get reduced. We could reduce the sodium ion, and we could reduce water. There, here in this case, guys, because it's an aqueous solution, there's two possibilities for the reduction half reaction. We could reduce sodium, or we could also reduce the water. And the question is, which of these is going to get reduced? Well, the answer to that question, guys, all the time, is the one that is easier to reduce. Okay? Let's look at the possible reduction half reactions. Here's one, okay, and here's the other. If we look at the reduction of sodium, this is pretty unfavorable, actually. This is negative 2.71 volts of the potential for that reduction. If we look at the water, it's negative 0.83 volts. It's easier to reduce the water here at the cathode. So that's in fact what you are going to see. Here at the cathode, the reduction half reaction is going to be water plus two electrons goes to H2 plus two hydroxide ions like that, okay? And so if we're going to look at the overall potential for the cell, okay, here's my oxidation half reaction, there we go, the potential here is negative 1.36 volts, okay? The reduction half reaction is water plus two electrons yields 
H2 plus 2OH minus, the potential for that step is negative 0.83 volts. And if I add that all together, guys, my total reaction here is going to be 2Cl minus plus H2O yields Cl2 plus H2 plus 2 hydroxide ions. And the overall potential for this cell would be negative 2.19 volts. That's the potential I'd have to apply to get this electrolysis to occur. All right. So there we go. Now, again, guys, why was it that this was the reduction half reaction? The answer is because that was easier. Okay. So when you are looking at an aqueous solution, guys, and we're, and we're considering the electrolysis of an aqueous solution, you have to keep in mind that water is always a candidate. Water can be oxidized. Water can be reduced. And it's going to be, you know, and, and you have to kind of, you know, determine, is that going to happen? And you know that the water is going to get oxidized or it's going to get reduced in the case that it's easier to oxidize or reduce the water. Okay? Um, that's more important for, for reduction. So generally speaking, guys, in aqueous solution, a substance will be reduced if its reduction potential is less negative than the standard potential of reduction for water, which is basically saying that, a substance is only going to be reduced in aqueous solution if it's easier to reduce than water. If water is easier to reduce, then water will be reduced. Hopefully that makes sense. We'll look at another example where uh, this is a possibility. Let's look at um, another electrolysis example. Here, this is one where we're going to electrolyze a solution of copper 2 chloride. Okay, so copper 2 chloride again is CuCl2. Okay, so the question is, consider the electrolysis of an aqueous solution of copper 2 chloride what reaction happens at the cathode, what reaction happens at the anode, and we're going to use some information that I'm going to give you guys here to formulate your response. Okay. And by the way, folks, this shows up on the AP exam all the time, all the time, all the time. Okay. And I'm also going to tell you guys that this is a neutral, or approximately so, neutral solution of copper 2 chloride. Okay. So if we consider this aqueous solution of copper 2 chloride, here's what we got. We're going to have Copper two plus ions here in solution, we're gonna have chloride ions here in solution, and we're gonna have water there in solution. Okay? Here are your your standard potentials here for each of these different um, possibilities. And of course here we're looking at the, you know, here's one thing. This if we have chloride ions in solution, this of course could be oxidized. Copper two plus could be reduced, and water could be either oxidized or reduced. Okay? If water is going to be um, oxidized, or if water is going to be part of the oxidation half reaction, here's one possible half reaction right there, okay? And if water is going to be reduced, here's the reduction, or the equation for the reduction of water with its associated voltage, okay? So let's go ahead and draw a picture of the cell. And guys, if any of the stuff that I'm saying doesn't make sense to you, rewind and watch it again. Okay, let's draw a picture. Here is my vessel. Okay, now I'm going to draw my electrodes first just because it looks neater that way. Here's an electrode and here's an electrode. And because we're electrolyzing copper 2 chloride and we don't want there to be a reaction with the electrodes here, we're going to use something that is inert. And I'm going to, just for the sake of argument, guys, we're going to use graphite for this one. I'm just going to use both carbon. Okay, so that's going to be carbon and graphite. All right, let me find my little picture here in the notes. Okay, so we're going to connect these two babies here with a battery. Here's my negative terminal, here's my positive terminal. Okay, and there we go. Here's me my solution. Now when you're choosing an electrode, guys, for, for an electrolysis cell, always use an inert electrode. If you're asked to draw a picture of an, ele an electrolytic cell on a test or on the AP test, etc. Okay, so here we go. This side over here, of course, is going to be positive, and you guys can all tell me this is, of course, going to be the anode. Okay, over here we're going to have our negative side. This is going to be our cathode. Okay, and if we think about the things we have in solution, we have copper two plus ions, we have chloride ions, and we have water floating around in here. And by extension, because we have water, we have a very, 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 very low concentration of H plus ions, and we'll also have a little bit of hydroxide ions. And where do those come from, guys? Those come from the auto ionization of water, okay? So, let's think about the oxidation 
half reaction, okay? If we go back here and we contemplate these different oxidation half reactions, say here's one possibility, the oxidation of chloride, here's the other possibility, the oxidation of, um, of hydroxide ion there that is in solution, okay? Now if we compare these two potentials here, this one is negative 1.36 volts, this one is negative 0 0.40 volts. Which of those is more, more favorable to happen? Well, of course, you guys are going to tell me, well, this is more favorable to happen, Mr. Harper. So you would think that would be the oxidation half reaction right here. But in fact, in this case, it is not. Why is that? Well, remember, guys, I told you, here's the main species we have in solution. We have copper 2 plus chloride and we have water. And we also have a little bit of hydroxide ion, but this is going to be at a very, 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 very low concentration, like 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7th molar, okay? If we assume here that my copper chloride solution is at a concentration of 1 molar, our chloride ion is present in much greater abundance, assuming this is a neutral solution, okay? So because the chloride ion here is, is present in much, 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 much greater abundance, like seven orders of magnitude greater abundance, this is going to be the oxidation reaction that is favored here. Also, it happens faster. Even though this one here is more thermodynamically favorable, this occurs faster. So that's going to be the one that, that happens, okay? So my oxidation to half reaction at the anode here is going to be chloride to chloride goes to chlorine gas Cl2 plus two electrons. Okay, let's take a look here at the cathode. Okay, the reduction step. Let me switch pens here. We'll go to a red color just to keep it distinct. Okay, here's my two possibilities for reduction. Okay, here's copper 2 plus could be reduced or water could be reduced. Which of those is more favorable? If we look, the potential here for the reduction of copper is positive, meaning that is very favorable. And if we look here at the reduction of water, this is a negative potential, meaning this is really not very favorable. So this is going to be my reduction half reaction right there because it is more favorable. So at the end, here's what happens. We're going to have copper 2 plus plus 2 electrons goes to copper metal. And there we go. All right. So if we look at the total uh, reaction for the cell. Here we go. We're going to have the oxidation step is 2Cl minus goes to Cl2 plus 2 electrons. Okay. The reduction step is copper 2 plus plus 2 electrons goes to copper metal. The potential for this half reaction is negative 1.36 volts. The potential for this half reaction is positive 0 0.34 volts. And if we add this all together, the total potential for the cell is negative 1.02 volts, and the total balanced reaction would be, since that cancels out, we're going to get two chloride ions plus a copper 2 plus yields Cl2 plus copper. Okay, and there we go. And if I was to ask you, well, how much potential we have to apply to carry out this electrolysis, you would tell me, well, of course, Mr. Harper, we would have to apply a voltage of 1.02 volts because this reaction is non-spontaneous and we have to force that to happen here with my battery. Okay, there we go, guys. So if I was to ask you observably, what do you expect to see happen into this cell? Okay, well, of course, over here, since we've got chloride ions that are getting oxidized, Cl minus going over here, they're relinquishing their electrons, becoming Cl2, we would expect to see bubbles forming at this electrode because these bubbles here are going to be Cl2, that's my chlorine that's forming. Over here, we would expect to see this electrode here getting larger, okay, and that solid deposit, this deposit here on this electrode would be copper metal, okay? So we would get pure copper metal out of this electrolysis reaction. And there we go. Okay, if you guys have any questions about that, please make sure you ask me on Monday, or uh, also please go back and make sure you rewind and rewatch this again if you have questions about what electrolysis is. Okay, now, um, we've seen how electrolysis works, okay? We're forcing electrons to happen, or for forcing electrons here to move against the natural flow, and we're you know, causing that to happen here with a battery, and when that happens, in this case, we're producing copper metal. Well, say for the sake of argument, guys, that I wanted to know how much copper I produce in this reaction, okay? Because 
you know, if I'm a chemist or, you know, working in industry someplace and I'm refining metals, I need to be able to calculate. I know that I can produce a metal by electrolysis, but I also want to calculate, well, how much can I make in a certain amount of time, okay? Let's take a look at that. Let's talk for just a minute here about current, okay? Current, like I told you guys before, is the movement of electrons, okay? And it's defined as the amount of charge, electrical charge, passing through a circuit per unit time. It is measured in something called amps, or, uh, you know, amperes. The symbol is the capital letter I. If you see an I someplace, that means current, okay? And that is one amp is one coulomb of charge per second, okay? Now, here's the tricky thing, guys. Um, we're talking here about the movement of electrons. Coulomb is how we measure the charge of an electron. One coulomb of charge is not equal to an electron. Okay, it's not equal to one electron, does not like correspond to one electron. But we can relate the amount of charge to the number of electrons. And there's a constant, okay, that does that. It's called the Faraday constant, as you guys may um, have divined through the reading. Okay, and here's what it looks like. One mole of electrons carries a charge of 9.65, approximately, times 10 to the fourth coulombs, okay? So this allows us to relate the number of electrons here to the charge that that mole of electrons here carries, okay? And of course, one mole of electrons here being, you know, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd power electrons. So if I know the current that is traveling through a circuit, I can use the Faraday constant to figure out from that, well, how many electrons are going through the circuit, and then I can use stoichiometry to determine how much of a product I'm gonna get through an electrolysis reaction, okay? So let's consider an example. Silver metal is often purified by electrolysis, okay? The question is this, if an electrolytic cell or an electrolysis cell is constructed so that silver is deposited at the cathode, okay, meaning that silver ions are being reduced to silver metal. This is almost always the way that it happens, guys. Your metal that you're refining is produced at the cathode, okay? and a current of 1.5 amps is passed through the solution. Okay, through a solution containing silver ions for 15 minutes, what mass of silver is deposited at the cathode? Okay, if you have a current of 1.50 amps, what that says is it's 1.50 coulombs of charge are passing through the circuit per second, okay? We're given here a time of 15 minutes, okay? The question is what mass of silver is deposited at the cathode? All right, well, the reaction that we're interested in here, guys, is silver plus here's the, the ion that's in solution okay we have silver ions in solution this is being electrolyzed the silver ions are going to be reduced according to this half reaction to give me silver metal okay so if we look at this reaction how many electrons are transferred per every mole of silver that we get out and the question is it's one one mole of electrons per uh, mole of silver that is produced, okay? So this is just actually going to be a dimensional analysis problem, but we're going to use the Faraday constant and the current, okay? So the given, the place I would start, guys, actually is the amount of time, okay? This is the easiest place to start. So I'm going to say we got 15 minutes, okay? That's where we start, 15 minutes. And here we are, the unit of time that we're using here is going to be seconds. So the first thing I want to do is change that turkey into seconds, okay? So one minute, of course, we know, it, or not one minute, sorry, okay, erase, not what we wanted to do. Nope. No, no. Go back. No, no. Continue recording. Go back. Okay. Go back. Okay. There's 60 seconds in one minute. Okay. So minute two is going to cancel out. Now I want to change this amount of time. Okay. Into charge. Here I'm giving the given to the current as being 1.50 coulombs of charge per second. I want to know the total number of coulombs that go through. Okay. So we're going to multiply here by this ratio. 1.50 coulombs of charge in every second that the current is running, okay? Now I want to change this coulombs of charge into moles of electrons, okay? I'm going to use the Faraday constant to do that, okay? Coulombs are going to go here on the bottom, and moles of electrons are going to go here on the top. One mole of electrons, according to the Faraday constant, is 9.65 times 10 to the fourth power coulombs of charge, okay? I know that I get one mole of silver metal produce for every one mole of electrons that go through my circuit, 
Okay, and of course, if I want the last step here is I'm trying to find what mass of silver I want to change my moles of silver here into grams. Okay, there's 107.9 grams of silver in one mole of silver, and there we go. Okay, so coulombs here will cancel out. Moles of electrons here will cancel out, moles of silver here will cancel out, and now I can go through and do my dimensional analysis calculation and get my answer. If I do that, my, I find the answer is 1.51 grams. Okay, so there we go. That's the mass of silver that would be produced through that electrolysis. All just dimensional analysis, guys. So a frequent, this is actually a frequent kind of question on the AP test. It might ask you, you know, what mass of silver or what mass of some product are you going to get? Or if we're talking about a gas, I could ask you what volume, or I might ask you how long it takes to electrolyze something and achieve a certain mass. And it's all just using dimensional analysis and our understanding of what current is. Okay? So there we go, guys. That is going to be the end of the podcast for today. There's a few topics left in Chapter 21 that we're going to talk about here next week, like corrosion and batteries and things of that nature, but this is going to be it. So please make sure you watch this podcast and take notes. I will see you guys on Monday. We will do some problems. We'll get some old AP questions, and it'll be a good time. Until then, guys, have a nice weekend, and I will talk to you later. Goodbye.